Well, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. As I said last week, we'll return to the book of Acts today. It's been a little while since we've been there. And as you're turning there, just a reminder, choir today at 4.30. Choir today at 4.30, getting ready for Easter. Man, we just finished Christmas cantata and getting all starting on Easter. So uh, just make a note of that. So, And by the way, I found out this weekend, we got another bass singer that's been like hiding out on us. Uh, I'm just, just saying. I mean, <coughs> uh, I don't know the initials, but I think, well, initials are Chuck T. Chuck Tisa, I think is the initials. Oh, trust me. Yeah, I heard you singing bass. You've been holding out on us. <laughs> I think there's others of you that are holding out too. So uh, it's time to show up to choir, man. <coughs> so at any rate. Um, title of the message this morning from Acts 20 is Living a Transparent, Focused Life. Um, who knows you best? Think about that question for a moment. Who knows you best? Who knows you better than anyone else? I, I know for those of you that are super ultra spiritual, you're going to say God. And that's an obvious. But let's kind of set God just right here just for a moment. And as far as physical people that you know, that you can touch, feel, see, who knows you best? And who knows the real you? You see, I think for most people, there's the person you want other people to know, and then there's the real you, right? Let's be honest. Because you don't want to go up to people and say, hey, you know, I got this really bad thing that I deal, deal with every day. You know, I got this sin that I'm really struggling with, or I got these real crazy quirks. I mean, I like, I eat crayons on the side, and nobody knows about it, you know. No, if that's you, I'm just kidding. Um, nobody's told me that. But there's... The you that you want everybody to know, right? And then there's the real you that God knows. Um, and I think here's the question that sometimes we, we need to struggle with. I think at least I think we should struggle with it. Are you willing to become vulnerable for the sake of the gospel? Would you be willing to do that? Open yourself up. To be transparent. To show your flaws. Your struggles. See, so often we want everyone around us to see a good version of ourselves, right? I mean, it, don't, I mean, if you're prone to getting drunk, do you want people to see that? If you're a quiet closet user of marijuana, do you want people to smell it on you? I'm just saying. We live in a world where people try to hide a lot of things, right? How many agree? We hide things from people because we don't want them to see the real us. And I think sometimes for us to be transparent, we have to become vulnerable and say, I'm struggling. Or, this is how I get through issues that God allows in my life. I think that's hard for a lot of us to do. And especially as men, we keep, men keep people at a distance, right? Because if we have problems, we're not going to let anybody know that they're there. At least we're going to do everything with our might to hide the problems that are there. We don't want people to know about those things. When I see the Apostle Paul, I see someone who's transparent. I, I think he even became vulnerable at times. Are you saying, Pastor, are you, are you saying I should tell everybody my, all my deepest, darkest secrets? No, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we need to be honest about where we're at in our walk with Jesus, and especially as it comes to relating to other people who need to see a picture of Jesus in us. Right? We need to let people see us as we are. We're trying to hide the struggles. I don't know about you, but I, I have found in my life that I can't get through struggles on my own anyway. I need people to be praying for me. I need people to encourage me. I need people that when I'm down, that will help lift me up. Anyone else? But you can't have that if you're not willing to open yourself up to some extent. As I was reading this passage, and you know, we've been going through this entire book of Acts, and you see a lot of repetitious cycles of what happens. Paul goes into this city, goes to the synagogue, has a dialogue. They get ticked off. The temple priests chase him out. He sometimes goes to jail or gets persecuted, but then he moves on and goes to the next city. It's just this vicious cycle that goes around in circles. And now all of a sudden you get to the end of chapter 20 or the middle of chapter 20, and he kind of changes focus a little bit. So Paul had been on a series of visits, and he started from Macedonia, goes to Greece, and then from Greece down to Troas, Stays in Troas seven days while there. He preached until midnight, which I've never done, by the way. 
Um, I, I don't have any plans of doing that either, by the way. And I'm thankful that because even while he was there, there was a man, the Bible says, who was in the, named Eutychus, who was in the third story window. That I, I don't know how, I, I'm just kind of envisioning this chapel, this uh, auditorium where Paul is preaching, this synagogue, whatever it is, you know, if you get in your mind's eye, it's got three stories and he's sitting up in the third story window and Paul is preaching till midnight. No wonder the guy fell asleep. I, I don't care how exciting the Word of God is, when it's midnight, you're tired. And so Eutychus is up sitting in a window, he falls over and <laughs> dies. Paul goes down, lays on him, brings him back to life. You know, end of story, funeral's over. And uh, so, I mean, Paul is there, he goes on. And so, I mean, the funeral hasn't even taken place yet. And, you know, so he's already boarding a ship. He's sailing to Assos and then on to Mytilene. And then they go to, to Chios and then on to Samos and Trogillium. He goes, these are all real, real cities, by the way. I mean, these are the towns that Paul is preaching in and going from village to village and so forth and sailing from, you know, coast to coast in these villages. And uh, from there they go on to Miletus and they continue on to Jerusalem. And Paul has been on this whirlwind tour uh, speaking and visiting several countries, and now he's taking time to share his heart and remind his listeners of who he is and what his focus has been. Um, it reminded me that, you know, sometimes we need to take a minute to thank God for what he's done in your life, where he's brought you from, and to be reminded what he's called you to. And here's a question that all of us should answer in our own hearts and our own minds. What is it that God has called you to? I mean, if you're going to share your ministry resume, so to speak, not your physical resume, not what you do for a living, you know, so often as we say, often, and I love what Michael Grubbs used to always say, God created us to be human, human beings, not human doings. Because so often we say, you know, we ask a question when we meet somebody new, what do you do for a living? And so often, our whole life is defined by what we do more than who we are. We're a child of God, right? And yet, we let what we do define us rather than who we are before God. And the reality is, I think sometimes we need to stop and think about our spiritual resume. What has God called us to? Not what do we do for a living. Not how do we pay the bills. Because those are important because all those can be areas of ministry, right? And should be areas of ministry. I've said for years, you, God gives you a job for two reasons. To take care of your families, because he said he that doesn't take care of his family is worse than an infidel. But secondly, so you can have a mission field to share Christ with. That's what you have a job for. So, but when it comes to why has God allowed you to live on this earth as a child of God, what is your purpose? Do you know what it is? So often we can go through the motions of life. We can get up, we can go to work, we can do this, we can do that. But do you know why God created you? Do you know how He's gifted you to serve Him? If you don't, we need to figure that out. Because when you begin to use your gifts for God, it's no longer work, it's ministry. I don't have to, well, i got to get this done. You know, I, I talk to some pastors and say, man, I struggle all week with this. I, I talked to a guy a couple weeks ago. He goes, man, I've been here eight years and man, I don't even know what to preach. I've preached through the whole Bible, and I don't know what else to preach. I'm thinking, whoa, <laughs> you are good, man. I have never met anybody who's preached through the whole Bible in eight years. But that's how we felt, because it was work. We haven't touched the surface and scratched the surface of what's in the Bible at eight years. But here's the thing. When you work within the gifts that God has given you, and you know your purpose, and you know why God has you here, ministerially speaking, You'll fulfill so much more. So the question is, do you know what it is? And Paul just took a minute to stop. And as he began to stop, he just said, this is what I'm here for. Question. When Paul became vulnerable, did he realize all that he was going to have to go through and what, and what he's going to share? Not even close. All we know, is what we've said before, is that God was going to show him all great things he must suffer for his name's sake. Uh, Paul's ministry, ministry resume was going to include a bunch of stories about how he suffered for the Lord. But what did Jesus say? If you go through some pain and struggle and suffering, guess what? Welcome to the family, because they did it to me first. And so far, many of us have had it really, really good. Haven't we? We've had it really good. We haven't hit, 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 had to hit that stuff yet. 
But Paul takes a minute, and so let's go ahead and begin to verse 17. I want to read down through verse 24, and then we'll start breaking it apart just a little bit. So from verse 17, he says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Well, sign me up. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So for a moment, Paul arrives in Jerusalem, right? He's passing. He doesn't want to spend a lot of time in Asia at this point. He's gone from, you know, the, as he's taking a ship ride, he's stopping at these little coastal villages, and he's preaching and teaching. He bypasses Ephesus because, remember, he'd already been in Ephesus. He called out the leaders of Ephesus, city of Ephesus, and the book of Ephesus, and they burned it, and he left his mark there as far as preaching the gospel and, and, and attacking the sinfulness of the city. And he moves right on past Ephesus and gets into Jerusalem, and then he calls for the Ephesian elders, the church leaders, that were in Ephesus. Remember, Paul had a heart to, to, to continue to work with and to train the leaders that he had put in those different... And we could take time and you go, every city that he went to, he did what? He, he established elders in the churches and, and trained them. So he had a heart to maintain a relationship with them. And so he gets to Jerusalem, he calls for the Ephesian elders to come join him, and he begins to just sit down and chat with them. He's ministerially gives them his resume and reminds himself of what God has called him to and what he is busy doing. And so basically he says in verse 17, so he calls the elders of the church to come. And verse 18, and when they had come to him, he says to them, here's what he says, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. He says, in other words, there has been nothing hidden. Think about that. Just, just stop and think about that one that phrase. You know how I lived among you from the first day until the last. He goes, it was all open to you. Everything I did was exposed to your sight. Everything that I am, you know. You were there. You witnessed it. You watched it every day. You're, you're observing. There was nothing hidden. Question. All of us are leaders in some regard. You're leading somebody. Somebody's looking to you. Are you living a transparent life before them? You realize from the time that I've come here, I'm not a perfect person. You've seen my flaws. You've saw my impatience. You see times that I make a decision and it's like, oh, doggone it, why did Pastor do that? You've witnessed that after 13 years. But you've seen how I use myself as an example. Man, sometimes I, my wife will look at me, why are you yelling? I'm not yelling. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Why are you yelling? I'm not yelling! I guess I'm yelling. Lord, I'm sorry. I always ask my wife, I know you love me, but do you like me? I mean, she, the God, God's Word tells her she has to love me. I'm, I'm another fellow Christian. I'm a human being. You have to love me. But do you like me? actually do this week. Sweet. <laughs> but there are people in our midst, and maybe you're one of them, that hides. And I think we've got to deal with that. Sometimes God's saying, where's the real you? I mean, I know, but ain't nobody else seen it. You come to church, and you bring your Bible, and you dress up, and you look the role, you, you're playing the role, you look the part, but what, how are you at home when nobody sees you? Who are you in private when nobody else is watching? Who are you when you're at work, when you're with a different crowd that likes to profane the name of Jesus or tell risque jokes or gripe and complain and murmur? 
Who does God know you to be? He says, you've seen me from day one. And what does he say? Verse 18 says, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I was lived among you. And here's how he said, this is how I did it. I served the Lord with all humility. He says, I serve the Lord always with humility. It's not bragging. He goes, I just wanted to be in the picture of Jesus to you. That's why he said in Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. He said, the bottom line is, I didn't want you to see Paul, I wanted you to see a picture of Christ in me as I served with humility amongst you. Why do you think he said that? As a reminder of how they were supposed to live. Who is he talking to? The Ephesian elders. The church leaders. So if you're a church leader, this also applies to you, right? If you lead a ministry, this applies to you. We should be examples to those that we are serving. And by serving in humility, by being a picture of Jesus. This is not anything new with the Apostle Paul. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 1, he says, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. In other words, it was profitable. From day one, he says, this has been a profitable trip. He spent his time. Paul had literally invested his life into the life of others. Think about that. Who are you investing in? You say, well, I'm not a teacher. That doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I'm just thinking out loud sometimes. You know, we should, we should have Grand Family Day or something, Grandparents Day. Invite every one of your grandkids here. And, and just invite every single one of them. And just let them know how much you love them and how much God loves them and how much God cares for them and how you want to be a part of their life and you want to encourage them as they walk with Jesus. And just have a day where you can just, I mean, you say, well, I do that all the time. Do you? Do they know that? I think sometimes there's this perceived thing of what we think we're doing versus what we're actually doing. I think we need to come together. And I think we need to do that. First Thessalonians 2, 5, and 6. For neither at any time did we use flattering words as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. In other words, I had no alternative agenda to get something out of it because, I mean, I was really nice. I did all these service projects so that, well, secretly I was hoping you'd give me some money or secretly I was hoping you'd give me this for doing it for you. He said there was no cloak of covetousness. I had no expectation of getting anything because I was doing it. He says God is witness to this. Nor did we seek glory from men. I didn't do it to get an attaboy. I didn't get to do it to get a pat on the back. I didn't do it because some, my name would be noticed. I didn't get a brick on the wall of the, si- uh, the wall of the hospital or on the sidewalk leading to this wing of the hospital. I didn't do it because my name was going to be recognized. I did it because it was the right thing to do. Nor did we seek the glory of men, either from you or from others when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. He says, did we have authority? Yeah. The authority was God-given. We had authority, but we didn't push it. We didn't use our position to get what we wanted. 1 Thessalonians 2, 9-11 says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. He says, you are witness to this. We worked hard. Man. Laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Isn't that cool? And he says, we were just simply giving, you know, I, I remember one thing my youth pastor said to me. I'll never forget it. He was like a second dad to me. You've heard my testimony, my story, how my dad was in the hospital most of my elementary years, going into, even into high school. My dad was in the hospital for months at a time, went through all kinds of problems. But my youth pastor became like a second dad to me. And I remember talking ministry with him as a, as a youth pastor. He goes, Ken, he goes, I'm not very gifted as a person. I would beg to differ. I watched that guy tear apart a motor on the side of a highway and put it back together and watch the thing run. The guy, I, I don't think he ever met a motor he couldn't tackle and win. That guy was gifted. He was a farm boy. There was nothing he couldn't fix. But he said when it came to instruments, he goes, I tried every instrument. Couldn't get a lick out of any of them. Tried sports. Couldn't, couldn't 
couldn't play him. He goes, I barely can walk and chew gum at the same time. He goes, I felt like as a minister of God, he goes, I had nothing to give to anybody. I'm not talented. I'm not skilled. I have no special abilities. He said, the only thing I had to give was myself. He goes, so that's what I gave. Isn't that awesome? There are probably 150 people like me that are in ministry because of his ministry. I'm not exaggerating. That man has people in ministry all across the United States because of his ministry. He just gave himself. That's it. He says, we preach to you the gospel. He goes, I just, he just lived it out. He just lived it out. That's what Paul was doing. And then verse 10, he says, You are witnesses in God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behave ourselves among you who believe. I don't know about you, but I don't know that I can say that. Because when someone irritates me, gets a little bit visibly irritated sometimes. So last weekend, I took my wife out for a night, and we went into an antique shop. And guys, I don't know about you, but me and antique shops, it's like walking into one antique shop, you've seen them all. You smelt one potpourri pot, you've smelt them all. You've been in one, you've been in them all. But I do it because my wife enjoys it, right? And we went into the shop. And the lady says, everything in here is 50% off. I'm like, sweet. My wife picks up this thing. I'm like, is this 50% off? Yep, great. Twelve, twelve fifty, I think it was, or whatever it was at half price. And we got three or four other little things. I'm like, this is a bargain. This is great. This is awesome. We go up there, and all of a sudden, she goes, how much is this one? And all of a sudden, I see three price tags. One says 149 one says 25 one says 44 And all of a sudden, now she realizes that somebody's interested in this. What tag does she want to use? Oh, Yeah. She, I said, well, I'm just saying out loud, because in my pea brain way of thinking, that is if there's three tags on it and the store is closing, yeah, Dave, you're already shaking your head. You agree with me. Somewhere there was a markdown. It went from 149 to 48 to 25. Common sense, right? Logical, makes sense. Oh, no, she's got somebody interested, and all of a sudden, well, I got somebody here, and then, you know, she turns her back a little bit and comes back. It's the 149 price, or 148. Of course it is, because you know somebody's interested in it. I'm not paying. No, thank you. By principle, I'll just you can have this thing now. I was visibly irritated because honor your stinking word and your stinking tag, or or don't do it. I, I'm just by principle, give me the price that's marked. Anyone else? Thank you. My wife goes, I think she knew you were a little upset. <laughs> Good. I'm glad she does. There are times that I can't say this. Ah, it drives me nuts. I want to be able to say it. You are witnesses. And God also, how devoutly and justly and... What's that next word? Blamelessly. We behaved. I was not blameless. I did not have a good attitude about me because you're a jerk. You changed the price. And my wife, she's just all happy-go-lucky, keep peace. But we got these other things at such a good price. Big deal, I wanted that one for you. I mean, I don't even care about the dumb item. I just wanted it for you because you wanted it. But how often can we really say that we live blameless? before the world that we live in. We, that we behave ourselves wisely amongst those who believe and don't believe. He says, we behaved ourselves, um, be, how we blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, and as, as you know and how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. As a father does his own children question came to my mind. What kind of things do you remember about those who you used to know or maybe have passed on before you? I think about what I used to remember. He says, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. 
You remember our attitude, our humility. You remember, and God is witness, how we behaved amongst you. What kind of things do you remember about those who've gone on before you? There are certain things I remember about my dad. Certain things I remember about my grandpa. Um, I'll tell you one thing I remember about my grandpa, my grandpa Todd. He was a he was a strong as an ox guy. He was six foot two, had a forty inch waist, and it went to a V. He was a sailor, and his arms were just he was monstrous. And he was strong. He was he was a man's man. Uh, taught woodworking and history in a public school for thirty some years. Nothing he couldn't make out of wood. But he was just a beast of a man, just strong as an ox. And I remember Don and I, on our honeymoon, stopped in and visited Grandpa. And I remember looking at his Bible, and I remember seeing, and it didn't hit me right away, it hit me later, that there were smudge marks on the pages. And I couldn't figure out why. There's tears. I, I'll never forget that. When it hit me, I was like, whoa, I, 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 it didn't hit me at first. Smudge marks. Crying over the scriptures he was reading. My grandpa was a godly man. I remember when my dad grew up, he lied his, on his age to get into the Air Force. <laughs> he was, my dad was pretty rebellious. Grew up in a godly home, but walked away from God during those Teen, late teenage years in his early 20s, went into the Air Force, came out living like everyone else, left his Christian faith behind, and then later God brought him back. But the reality is, my grandfather, I believe, prayed much over my dad and over other things, and I remember seeing the smudge marks on his Bible from his time with God. I'll never forget that. That's a precious memory to me. How will you be remembered? Paul was challenging these Ephesian elders. You remember. And in Thessalonica, you remember. You know this. God is witness to this. How will you be remembered? Remember this, this title, Living a Transparent, Focused Life. Are you transparent enough to let God work through even your flaws for God to use you? He says, and charged every one of you, even as a father does his own children. He says, you're witnesses to this. Not only that, he says in this text in Acts chapter 20, he says, how, how, I always, how, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, with all humility, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency from God. He said, it's not about me. It's not about me. It will never be about me. It can't be about me. Because if it's about me, it's not about him. He says, with many tears, and this has been a theme of Paul, when God so changed his heart, he gave him a heart of compassion. How do I know that? Romans 9, 2 and 3. In Romans 9, he says in verse 2, he says, that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He says, I have sorrow and grief for my brethren, his, his countrymen, the people that he had grown up with, the people that he, God sent him to minister to. He says, I have I have." grief for them. Why? Because he wanted them to know Jesus. Let's be honest. We are so focused on what we have to do from day to day and just existing that we don't think much about those outside the family of Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to speak to myself. I don't want that to be the case. In fact, I think it's better than I actually admit sometimes. No, it's not. Because I get so wrapped up in doing what I want to do or how I feel or what I think is important versus what I think is not important. Anybody else honest enough to admit it? We are so selfish. 
2 Corinthians 2, 4 says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, because I'm not saying that you have to carry the same burden, but what's he saying? But that you might know the love with which I have so abundantly for you. He goes, I want you to know I love you. I care for you. I want you to know the Jesus I know. Isn't that awesome? Acts 20.31 Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Just Can I just ask a question? that I'm asking it to all of us, myself included. I want you to be honest. Just answer between you and God. When is the last time you had one single tear? Just one single tear for someone who that you know who may die without Jesus. Think about that. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? See, we love our kids because they're ours. We love our children because we invest so much time and energy and effort and thoughtfulness into them. We love the ones that we're closest to. And we would certainly cry if something happened to them. But do we cry for those who are dying and going to hell apart from a relationship with Jesus? Am I saying you've got to go start knocking on doors? Nope. I don't think that's going to do it, but honestly. I think what God wants us to do is live out our faith every day in front of what That's what Paul was doing, right? I don't see anywhere where Paul just went door to door to door to door to door to door and you know with the Gospel of Romans Road. What I see is Paul living it out day by day, just with the people he comes in contact with, the people that God put in his path of daily activity, just simply living Jesus in his life. And in verse twenty, check this out. Isn't this cool? He says how I kept back nothing that was helpful. So, how many would you agree that the people that you know and love and the people that you care for, whether even, even if you don't know them, it's helpful that they have food? That's all? The rest of you don't think that's helpful? If you think that's helpful, raise your hand. There we go. How many think it's helpful that they have clothes on their body? How many think it's helpful that they have food? That they have... A, a, a roof over their head to protect them from the elements and warm bed. And see, see, we would help with all those things, right? But how many also think that it's helpful to reprimand when they make mis- make mistakes as children? How many also think it's it's helpful to sit down and talk to them about choices and consequences because some choices have real harsh consequences, and that's helpful to have that conversation. How many think it's helpful to warn them when they are making poor choices? How many think it's necessary and helpful to, sh- to help them understand where they will spend eternity when they die? The hands aren't going up anymore. He says, I kept back nothing that was helpful. He goes, I taught you both publicly and from house to house. You know, and when I say house to house, it's the idea that the house church that they went, he went from house to house, those that were involved, he says, I taught them publicly and from house, I believe that was the house church, those that were involved. And then he goes on, he goes, I testified to both Jews and Greeks of repentance towards God and faith towards go- the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, for those of you that needed repentance, he goes, we shared that story, that message. Those of you that needed the gospel, he goes, we shared that, that, that message. He goes, I was faithful. How don't you, but when I read this, it's a reminder of the things I should be doing as a leader, not only in the church, but to my family and to those who are around me. And now he says in verse 21, look at this. He says, testifying to Jews, also to Greek, repentance through God, faith, in, faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit. Think of that phrase, bound in the Spirit. You know what it means to be bound, right? If I were to put a set of handcuffs on you or zip ties or a rope, I was to tie you together or tie your feet up, bound, 
when you're bound, you don't have a choice, right? You're stuck. You're, you're, you're stuck. You, you, if you guys set a handcuffs on you, you're not deciding what you're going to do. He says, I'm bound in the Spirit. In other words, I'm not controlling myself. The Spirit is controlling me. The Spirit has bound me as I go to Jerusalem. And here's what he says. Testifying to me that chains and tribulations await me. That's where it says, sign me up, right? You know, the Holy Spirit is going to bring me to this next place of ministry. And wait a minute, uh, help me understand this, God. I'm going to be going through tribulation when I get there. And God, why are you sending me there? Help me understand this, because this is not making sense to me. How many would have that thought? I'm going to send you there knowing that you're going to go through trouble and tribulations and frustrations. And yeah, your will is not your own anymore. Welcome to ministry. Welcome to following Christ. Wow. But what is Paul's attitude? Get ticked? Get even? Go a different direction? No. Verse 24 is his attitude. He says, but none of these things move me. Stop right there. He goes, okay. What am I going to do? Am I going to change the mind of God? (laughs) There's plenty of passages that say you're not going to change the mind of God, right? I have my plans, but God controls my plans. So you're not going to alter your plans because God controls them. He says, these things don't move me. I'm still committed. What does it take for you to drop your commitment? Flat tire? Sore throat? Headache? I mean, it doesn't take much, let's be honest, right? I, I, I'm just speaking for myself. I mean, I can come up with a million reasons why I shouldn't have to do something that I know I should do. I can justify it, rationalize it, excuse it. As I've said a million times, I'm, I'm good at it. You need some help coming up with an excuse? Just talk to me. I'll give you one. I can make it look valid. I'm good at it. You are too, by the way. But the reality is, he says, these things don't move me. He goes, 24, nor do I count my life dear to myself. He goes, I am nothing. I'm a nobody. Take me out of the picture, nothing changes. That's his attitude. He says, it's not about me. Why? So that I may finish the race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. His desire was to finish the race that God had him in with joy. Even knowing that he had tribulations and trials awaiting him. 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He desires to testify of the grace of God. Notice how Paul viewed his responsibility as a leader to these elders. Remember, we started this thing off where he said, I want all the Ephesian elders to meet me here. And he begins to transparently share his ministry resume, so to speak, so that he can remind them and give example to them how they should be serving the church. But this is how he viewed his responsibility as a leader. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. He said, guys, guard yourselves. Yes, follow those leaders in leadership, but guard yourselves. 1 Peter 5, 2 and 3. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those that entrust you, but being examples to the flock. That's what he's called us to do as leaders, is to be examples and to, to shepherd, not to, well, I'm the pastor, you need to do what I say. It's not my church. I get to be a steward here, but it's not mine if you haven't figured that out. I don't tell anybody, this is my church. I'm not the church. We are the church. And I have no authority over you as an overseer saying that you have to do what I say. I, that's not my job. One day you will stand before God for what you do, and I will stand before God for what I do as a person and how I minister here. And I don't take that lightly. And if I 
lead this church in the wrong direction, trust you me, God will take care of it. I want to do everything I can because I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to unnecessarily go through some difficulty be, you know, that I could have avoided. He says, don't use your authority to beat people up. That's just wrong. And there are pastors that do that. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel, therefore I urge you to imitate me. He says, I have been working with you, I have discipled you, I have trained you. I'm just telling you, this is how you live out Christ in your life. That's why he says imitate me. Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. He says, if you're wondering, come to us. Mock us. I mean, uh, model us. He goes, we're living out Jesus every day. And one more. Philippians 4, 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, Paul says, these things, what? Do. He goes, it's not about me. Because he goes, remember, I'm not, it's not about me. He goes, but I've learned some things. I don't think Paul's a young man at this stage. God has done a work in his life. And he submitted fully and completely to God. And that's why he could say, imitate me. Do what I'm doing. And he says, and if you'll do it, the God of peace will be with you. Follow Jesus. When I look at this passage, as he's sharing with the Ephesian elders, I say for all of us, these are some great examples for us. That if we would do these things, God would honor them. Amen? The bottom line is, we, we have a ways to go. And when I start thinking about our daily walking with Jesus, my goodness, I fall short. I fall short, too short. And sometimes I have this idea in my mind that I'm better than I am. Hogwash. Baloney. We all sin. We all struggle. The only difference between my sin and your sin, I say often, is your sin might look a little bit different than mine. One might be more visible than the other. But all sin breaks the heart of God. And all sin needs to be dealt with. But when it comes to our walk, that's so important that we walk and that we live it out. I don't know where you're at, but you and God do. And if it's not where it needs to be, I encourage you to get it where it needs to be. You can't do it alone. But with his spirit, you can. I don't know about you, but I'm excited that God still loves me enough that he still speaks to me. That he hasn't given up when I fail, because I failed so many times. And he still loves me, still cares for me, still is patient with me, still is long suffering with me, still forgives. Because he has he loves us more than we love ourselves. And we love ourselves a lot. I don't know. You and God know what you need to work on. As we've been going through these things, you can, you're in your heart, you're saying, yeah, that's me. Deal with it. Don't put it off, right? Let's pray, and then before we do anything, we're going to take a minute to observe the Lord's table, and then we'll be dismissed. But let's just take a moment and pray. And I would encourage you, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, right there where you're at, you say, Pastor Ken, God, God, God has challenged me in some areas this morning. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Can I just challenge all of us? Every one of us that are here this morning. If God has challenged you in one or more of those areas, just take a moment and deal with it. Just right there where you're at. Say, Lord, forgive me. I mean, if I'm honest with myself and God knows my heart, there's been some things hidden that need to be exposed so that they can be made right. God knows my heart. There's some areas I haven't served very well. God knows my heart. There's some areas I haven't been very humble in. I have not been exercising humility. Tears? I haven't shed a tear for anybody. God knows that. God, forgive me. Give me tears for those that you want me to have tears for. I I hold back nothing that was helpful. There's some conversations that need to be had with my children, some loved ones, some friends that I care for. I'll meet their needs that are easy to meet, but the spiritual needs, ah, I've held those back. He said, I held back nothing that was good for them, that was helpful. He said, I proclaimed what was helpful. You haven't done that. 
Maybe there's some things that the Holy Spirit is working in your heart concerning that need to change. Just say, God, forgive me and help me to get these things right with your help. Just take a moment and just talk with God. Lord Jesus, um, Lord, you know our hearts better than we know them. And Lord, Paul was just being transparent. And in so many passages, Lord, we know the heart of Paul. We know what he went through to get to where you brought him to. He was a portion of his life, an evil man. He persecuted in the name of Jesus. He got special permission from the Pharisees the, and, and the, the chief priests, Lord, to bring those hand and bound who are followers of Christ back to Jerusalem to have them persecuted. God, we know that you did a work in Paul's life, that you so changed his heart, his direction, his purposes. And he was just transparent before his people. And how the change that you made in his life was so drastic. And Lord, you can do that to anyone. For anyone. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be like Paul in these areas, Lord. May we imitate him. I believe even Paul was, as he was talking to the Ephesian elders, would speak to us. Follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. Do what I have done and you will have the peace of God upon you. And he could only say that because he was following you, Jesus. Be with each one that's here this morning, Lord, as we've acknowledged there's areas that need to change. And Lord, we acknowledge we can't do it in our, of ourselves. We can't do it by ourselves. Lord, we need your help. We need your Holy Spirit to do the work that we cannot do. And so, Lord, we ask for victory this week. We ask for change this week in our lives. We ask that you might be glorified through all that is said and done. Be with each and every one of us, Lord, <coughs> that we might see your hand at work. And we'll praise you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.